Cristo. It was a dark era in ancient Greece, several thousand years ago, where gods clashed with titans and mortals bent to their will. Ares! Destroy my enemies, and my life is yours! It was also a time when a ruthless and skilled Spartan captain rose to power by spreading terror and brutality throughout the villages of Athens. Burn the spirit! Burn it to the ground! With his lust for victory, and through a devilish pact with the god of war, Ares, he found himself seeking vengeance against the very gods who have given him his unyielding power. Ares! Athena! You conspire against me! You will pay for this, Zeus. Be certain of that. Thus was born the story of Kratos. Conceived not in the ancient chronicles of Greek mythology, but in 2004 in a revolutionary game development studio in California. With director David Jaffe at the helm, the team at Santa Monica Studios created what some have deemed one of the greatest games ever made. It's a great game to allow you just to pick up and unleash your dark side and just go nuts. Released in 2005, God of War sold millions of copies and garnered numerous awards and heaps of critical acclaim. A legend was spawned, whose story was carried across several epic sequels that have met similar sprawling success. With each installment in the God of War franchise, a new director was summoned to continue the story of Kratos creating a fresh experience for a well-known and established character. Join us as we meet the unique minds behind the legend and learn how each director developed their respective games and contributed to the mythology of God of War. We have some Kratos fanboys here, I assume. Yeah. Nice. God of War revolutionized the gaming industry with its epic storytelling, jaw-dropping action sequences, and a compelling cast of gods and goddesses, not to mention a quick and brutal lesson on Greek mythology. It is something I consider to be one of the most eye-catching and platform-defining franchises out there, and has set the standard for every action game that has tried to follow. Today we will discover the vision behind the vengeance as we meet the directors of each of the God of War installments. First up, his visionary eye has brought us the destructively satisfying Twisted Metal series, which holds the record for being the longest running PlayStation exclusive franchise. But that wasn't enough for this ambitious alum from USC. He went on to direct the very first God of War, thus introducing us to the world's ultimate badass. Please welcome David Jaffe. <laughs> Next, as animation director of the first God of War, his talented team brought Kratos to life in groundbreaking graphical glory. On God of War 2, he expanded the story of Kratos, deepening the saga and turning it into a legend Please welcome Corey Barlog. <laughs> good there? I'm all right. Everything's good. <laughs> With over 11 years of experience in the entertainment industry, our next director has co founded Ready at Dawn Studios, which has given us amazing PSP classics such as Daxter and two God of War games. For the first time in 2008, God of War went mobile and gamers were finally able to bring the epic story of Kratos wherever they went. Please welcome the director of God of War Chains of Olympus, Rue Virasoria. <laughs> right on, dude. 
As lead environment artist for the first God of War, our next guest helped establish the world that Kratos would inhabit. He stepped up to become the director of one of the greatest and most legendary games ever created for the PlayStation 3. Please welcome Stig Asmussen. <laughs> And finally, this director began his God of War career with Ready at Dawn Studios, where he was lead level designer for God of War Chains of Olympus. This year, he is tasked with leading the entire team and helming one of the most anticipated games for the PSP. Please welcome Dana Jan. Ladies and gentlemen, the creative directors of the God of War franchise. Okay, so guys, I have to ask, how are you feeling about this? I mean, this, this evening is all about you guys and these amazing games that you've created. You feeling good? Yeah, absolutely. There's tons yeah, of excitement I mean, coming well, from your I, side can of the I, stage. Can I, just, can I just say thank you to all you guys for coming out? This is, uh, it is amazing. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's pretty cool. Pretty cool. So I'm, I'm, I'm feeling thrilled and honored and grateful. Yeah. You guys all had a Red Bull before this show. Come on. Yeah, actually, I got one right here. <laughs> we, still, we still have the Murano. Actually, I, I want to add, too. I, I think it's, um, I mean, you guys are pretty much a testament to all the work that we do. I mean, the reason why we're here and the reason why we're doing this right now is because of the fans. And, and um, you guys make our job worth it. You know, it's fun making great games, but we do it for you guys as much as we do it for ourselves. <laughs> We should probably break it down, brass tacks, at the beginning. What exactly does a game director do? This is an excellent question. I, we, we talked about this earlier, but uh, I mean, from my perspective, I mean, uh, a game director actually is kind of like, you know, a captain on a ship. They, they're basically there to make sure that everybody is doing the right thing and, and steering the thing in the right direction. And so, from my perspective, you're, you're actually, you know, involved in a little bit of everything. Um, but at the same time, I, I think that you had an interesting perspective on that too, and so did David about actually doing nothing. Yeah, I, I mean, the way I look at it is like, maybe you do everything, but really you kind of do nothing. And I know Dave doesn't agree with that, <laughs> but, but what I mean when I say that is like, when you become a director, you're not rolling up your sleeves and getting down and dirty like the rest of the team members do, and, with the, and the, the sweat that they put in is actually propping your ideas. So um, I, I think a real general way you can look at it is um, the game director kind of is this guy that's got this vision. And very early on, he's got to be able to play the game, he or she has to be able to play the game from beginning to end in their head. Very early on. Well, I mean, see this, this <clears throat> See the game. And they, and they have to illustrate, they, the they, 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 <laughs> they have to be able to illustrate that to the rest of the team. You're right, I mean, everybody, I don't, I don't know your background, but I mean, you can animate, you can draw, you can draw. Not I anymore. Can, you know, I can, what? <laughs> Not, Not anymore. anymore. <laughs> but I mean, so yeah, I mean, obviously the guys who are also in the trenches who then move into a director role, I, I imagine would have a different perspective on it. But my perspective though is that when you talk about sort of the vision of the game, especially on the first God of War, when nobody, with the exception of a couple of us, had any idea what it was, every single day you are sort of having to deal with the fact that you've got a very talented, incredibly educated, brilliant team that's going, does this guy know what he's doing? And you have to figure out a way to convince them by hook or by crook that you actually do have a vision in your head. And so when you say, well, the director doesn't do anything, I'll tell you what, I mean, it is a great job and I, I, I'm hopeful that, that, that Sony allows me to continue to do it for them as long as, as they appreciate what I can do. But it is, it is a hard motherfucking job. And you guys managed, I don't know about you guys, but you two guys managed to do the job and still be really well liked on the team. I, <laughs> you know. Well, I think you bring up something really interesting about that though, is that that idea of, of having, you know, the vision of the game in your head and having to actually command a team of people to trust that what you're telling them to do or not to do is the right thing when whether or not they can see it and you know they may have their own idea how some things should go but maybe it doesn't fit into this gigantic puzzle that you know ultimately how it should turn out or hopefully you do and hopefully you take the right criticism and the right you know kind of but let's questions. be honest a lot of the time we have no clue what we're talking about <laughs> i mean there are a lot of leaps that you make in this job where you're like all right look i kind of know what i want but sometimes you're discovering as you go yeah there's and a, the thing is that that's a, the hard part if you don't believe it yourself or if you don't know it yourself yet it's making people believe 
in the idea. That's, I think, the one of the hardest things. Becoming Otherwise known as lying. Yeah, well, <laughs> but, but, that but, too, but becoming the cheerleader, right? But yeah. the Even when the mor morale is down, you got to make people believe that this is the right thing to do. And that's one of the biggest jobs, actually, as a game director, is always making people believe that this is good, regardless of how bad feels, things and I, feel. I have to respond to that, though, because seriously, as you're, you're right when you're talking about specifics. If it's like, shit, how do the Icarus wings work? I don't oh, yeah, know. Yeah. Yeah. But the Not nugget, on the, general. The, the core heart and soul of that game, I do think you have to know it from the minute you walk in, and that's what you have to protect yeah. the whole process through. So how did you guys become game directors? Because I, I don't think until recently you could actually go to college to be a game director. How, what path led you to this career? There is no, and I guess, an, there is except no for you, no, even for you as well? Well, for me, it was just a Corey quit. Yeah, he quit, so I got it. So really, all you got to do is find somebody to quit. <laughs> Well, just you were, quit. You were saying you started in animation and you guys started in drawing. Is that, yeah. how, is that eventually what led to it? No, there was no direct path on that. <laughs> me doing animation and me ending up in directing was really, I guess the only reason I got it is because everybody who was good turned it no, down. No, no, no. Corey and I had had a lot of discussions about the storytelling in Max Payne 2. And that was, we were very much about how do we tell stories via interactivity and not through cutscenes. And the minute we started having those conversations, it was like, okay, he gets it. And so it wasn't that everybody else turned us down. It was just But it that, was. It wasn't. It was the fact it was the fact <laughs> that those conversations kind of happened after yeah. everybody turned us down. If they would have happened <laughs> earlier, you know. All right, all right. I, I think sometimes that. you just fall into it. I actually didn't wasn't expecting to direct. It just so happened that the person who want, was leading the project right there didn't fit in the in the mix. I believe that the game should be something different than what it was you know, shaping up to be, and basically said, you know what, I'm going to take the reins. And it's not so much that somebody tells you you're going to be that, it's that you, you, are, you become the person that the team needs. And I think that for all of, all of us, I think it kind of is that, right? You for me, it was actually kind of the opposite. I mean, after Corey left, the, the team is kind of deliberating and trying to decide, like, who is going to do it next. And I actually went into my boss's office, and I named two people, and I wasn't one of the names. And he said, what about you? I'm like, no, I gave you the two people I thought it should be. <laughs> And then uh, he brought me back about a week later, and he's like, you're going to have to do it. And it, the thing is, the, team, the thing that really sold me is the team is really behind it. He had done a lot, conducted a lot of internal interviews and everything, and um, that meant so much to me. And, and, and it, to be honest with you, it was a, it was a challenge. And, I, and, it, and at the time, I, was, it, I questioned a little bit, and now I don't question it at all. It was the greatest decision I ever made. I love it. And you know what, I, just to finish on that idea, when I was doing a Chains of Olympus, it almost was a natural transition for Dana to do what he did. I actually asked him before we finished Chains of Olympus, as much as, yeah, it would have been cool to, to do a second one, I asked him one day, hey, do you want to direct the second one? You just said you didn't want to do this anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like along those lines. Just pass the buck. Yeah. It appears to usually happen in the most weird places. Yeah. It's like, away, hey, yeah. it's in the kitchen and you're having a bagel. Yeah, exactly. Someone's like, hey, you want to direct the next game? Yeah, sure, all right. But I mean, if, if, I drinks, just, usually. <laughs> if, if I can kind of speak to the other end, because to me, it's a coveted position. It is a position that, that I fought for, that frankly, when I started at Sony, there, were, there weren't even designers. The idea of going you know, to my bosses and saying, hey, I want to be a designer, it's like, do they have those in video games? I mean, this was back in 16-bit you know, side-scrolling days. It was like, ah, the artist will do it, and the programmer will add some pickups. I mean, that was literally how 95% of the games got made, it was certainly console games. And so first it was fighting to explain we need designers in games. And then, and not every game needs a director, but a game like this, where you are establishing a universe, if you don't have, whether it's a good vision or a bad vision, if you don't have a singular vision that everybody is funneling through, everybody's off making their own pieces. And if you're talking about building a brand new universe and you don't have a, a core idea that, that is sort of a singular vision, and ultimately the whole team, not the whole team, but key members of the team begin to add to that, you just end up with a big, you know, mishmash, and it, it usually is a game that gets canceled. So for this game, it was a it was a position that I was proud that we kind of pushed and said we need this as a position for this game. Right. So let's talk about how God of War started. How did you even come up for the idea for this brand new universe, as you were saying? Dave. <laughs> well, <laughs> here, Dick. Um, in in, a, in the best possible way. <laughs> that even sounds not good. Um, no, you know, but no, seriously. So I had always wanted to do a game that felt like you were going on this big adventure. And so that, that and my initial love of Greek mythology were sort of the, the initial you know, ideas of, hey, let's, let's make a God of War, or let's make a, a Greek video game. And then there was a sense of you know, brutality and violence, frankly, is something that a lot of gamers that sort of embrace this genre like. And we were kind of like, well, what if we kind of mix that 
with Greek mythology, which was very violent and very sexual and very adult, and if you read it. Um, and so that's sort of where it all really began. Everybody already knows it's a team effort. Everybody knows that Jaffe didn't do God of War 1 by himself. But until Corey came on and brought the animation to Kratos, it was like I could show everybody videos of Russell Crowe and Romper Stomper till the fucking cows come home. But until, and I, and I did, I said, do you see how he's slamming this guy's head into the bar? And, and I, but until Corey came on and was able to actually take that and express it through animation, he was kind of a dead character. And, you know, this is, Corey is as much as, if not more, the father of Kratos than I am. Oh, Dave. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> he actually yeah. explained what the character was. Oh, sorry. But that he said it was uh, Martin Riggs and Russell Crowe. Yeah. That was the example you gave. First day on the job, he's like, hey, Greek, Greek mythology, he's, he's Martin Riggs and he's Russell Crowe. Go. I remember the, the one sheet that we turned into Sony that said sort of what if, it, it actually said what if Paul Verhoeven, which nobody knew, so I changed it to Ridley Scott, but what if Ridley Scott directed Clash of the Titans? And it was the idea of basically taking that kind of very adult sensibility and applying it to Greek mythology. And so there were a lot of stories that, uh, I mean, we originally had Kratos um, mimicking the, uh, the Perseus's mother story where he was put in a box and thrown into the ocean and covered with chains, and that's where his chains originally came from because it crashed on the rocks, and Ares was attacking the seaside village. And I mean, it was, and, and every, everything kind of technology and animation, and Charlie Wynn, who was the concept artist who really kind of gave birth to this character visually, everything fed into everything else. And my favorite story about that that just really shows how incestuous it is, is that Charlie was doing, I went to him and I said, do a version of Kratos like Ed Norton from American History X when he was the Nazi. Right, because he was just so, I mean, he's a Nazi, but in terms of his physique, that scene where he curb stomps that guy and he's like, Argh! and it's like, holy shit, he's badass, you know? And, uh, and so he kind of did, it didn't look like Ed Norm, but it had that vibe. And the way Charlie draws, and I don't know if most artists do this, but I had never encountered this, where he drew it, but the skin was all white. And it wasn't that it was white, it was, it was like a primer or something. And I mistook that for, oh, you gave him white skin, and that's awesome. He's like, no, no, I gotta color him in. And I said, oh, no, 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 don't, don't do that. This is genius. And from that, we, me, I remember it was me and Charlie and one other guy, I forget who it was, standing there. And we said, well, we got to come up with a reason why he has this skin now. And that gave birth to the story of, hey, he kills his family and the, he gets cursed and that's the ashes of his dead family. So everything on a game, because it's not like a movie where you have a screenplay and then you make it. You're making the game well before you know all the elements of the story. Everything kind of fed into each other until the very end. It's like, oh, I guess we have a complete product. I'll be quiet now. You guys should say something. <laughs> now, uh, okay, so Kratos is this, you know, bloodthirsty character with no real moral compass beyond personal vengeance, really. Yet we all root for him. Why do you think that is? I think it goes to the core of what you were talking about also. He's the alpha male, but at the same time, the whole Martin Riggs thing with Russell Crowe really rings true. It's just that it's, it's the kind of guy that you, you don't want him to be all good or all bad. You want him to straddle the line. And that's the thing, like that's what makes him so great is that he straddles that line between you don't really agree, but you're fine doing that because ultimately you know the end goal is right. And it's, it's the making of every great, great hero in every story, I think. If you look at the history of humanity, if you look at the greatest stories out there, it's always about that guy who straddles the line. He's also the underdog. I was yeah, gonna say the, the same underdog. thing. And that's, I mean, everybody loves a good underdog story, and he's not a likely, he's, he's not the one that you, you, you know, normally think of it, but um, he's, for me, that was the biggest thing. Well, he's, he's an underdog, but he's like the ultimate underdog. Right. I mean, he's, he's this human, you know, going up against gods and creatures of mythic proportion, so it's like, it's the underdog times like a hundred. It's the underdog yeah. that you believe can take yeah. down a titan. But I, I, to me, like, personally, like, I, I relate to him, and it's, it's not about the moral stuff, it's about, like, what, what Dave was talking about, like, really early, was that, you know, if you could do, if, if something frustrates you or you're angry about something, you need, to, you need to, you know, conquer something, if you can do it in a fashion that's just epic and over the top like Kratos can, you know, like, who wouldn't be, you know, compelled to play a game about a character who, like, has these same challenges and, and faults and flaws as everybody else has, but when he wants to do something about it, it's, you know, ripping the heads off a of Hydra or something like that, you know, like, that's awesome. So. And it's interesting about Kratos is that while he may be uh, maybe not an anti-hero, but, but, you know, fairly myopic in his view of having vengeance, he kind of inadvertently changes the world around him for the better in almost every situation. Sure, he may have a huge body count and a bunch of blood following him, but, I mean, you know, he, he, he's bringing down a, a fairly corrupt system of gods. In the end, he, he actually gives mankind free will. So I think his actions, while, you know, 
from a different perspective on its own desires actually help the world, which I don't know if everybody sees it that way, but... With the success of the first God of War, what was the reasoning behind getting a different director for every installment? Did you just become too expensive? I wish. <laughs> wow. I mean, I left Sony because... You know, for me, it was a sense of... I was looking at what these games were making, and I was just like, you know, and I was seeing friends selling companies and making a lot of money, and I don't know if I'll ever have the ability to do that, but it was me kind of going, you know what? I, I want to strike out and kind of try to make great games and make a crap ton of money. And that's just honest. I was just like, you know what? There's a lot of money in this industry. Maybe I'll never get any of it, but it would be kind of cool if I could. And so that was why I left and you stepped in. Yeah, uh, I think it was a little bit of the same. Uh, for me, I liked going into work with the people I liked going into work with. So seeing a lot of those people leave, and Eric Williams was uh, a guy I'd worked with for like the last 15 years. He was the main combat guy on God of War 1 and God of War 2. Uh, he was striking out to be a consultant, and Shannon had left as well. Uh, Phil Harrison, and that was a really big blow to me. I'm just kidding about that. Um, <laughs> So, so I kind of realized, like, you know what, uh, staring down the barrel of a, a long three-year crunch on that game uh, with not some of the people, uh, excluding some of the people I really enjoyed working with, kind of, it didn't appeal to me anymore. And other opportunities, you know, getting to work with George Miller, I was pretty much not going to pass that up. So it wasn't any sort of indicator of like, hey, you know what, we got to have a different director. It was a good spin. It's a great spin to say, hey, we have a different director. That was the whole pro process from the beginning, is we wanted somebody different. But the reality is maybe our own egos got in the way. So we all wanted to move on and do bigger, better things, calling old cars. Yeah, I mean, for me, personally. <laughs> 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 nice job there. <laughs> but as far as you know, moving on, I think it's not so much that I didn't like doing what I did or anything like that, but we started the company, or I, me and a couple of uh, other friends, and at the time that God of War was finishing, I think the company as a whole needed me more than the game did. And I was juggling business with making a game, which is always a bad idea because you end up by arguing with yourself constantly. Because creative ideas don't necessarily make good business ideas. And, uh, and when I talked to Dana, it was mainly that. It was just, you know what, for, at least for the time being, I need my focus on strengthening the, the company. And I couldn't do both and be sane. But you know what, that said, we have five directors, five games. I think that, that that's the reason why the games work that well. I was and just gonna ask, why do you think having so many different directors is beneficial to the franchise? Different, we all have our different takes. We might not agree with everything that we would do you know, in each of the games, but that was the beauty of it, right? It's like the franchise wouldn't be what it is if not for the fact that we all brought a little bit of ourselves into the game we're making. So then let me ask you this, as the franchise has, has progressed, how have each of you changed the character of Kratos? How do you think his, his arc has grown over the games? I'd actually say his arc is, it kind of goes all over the place, I think. You know, he has that consistent desire, I think, that was sort of instated in the first game of, I want to die. I did this horrible thing and I'll never forgive myself for it. And it sort of returns a little bit to that, um, but I mean, I think it maybe it's a little bit to our detriment, perhaps. We haven't evolved his arc to change him as a person. I mean, he still kind of just shouts at the gods and says Ares and Athena a lot, <laughs> uh, which is great. He's an honorary character, but there are layers beneath that that I think we could have explored. I know for myself, I feel like there was a lot of balls I dropped. That didn't sound right, did it? <laughs> no, he didn't. I dropped the ball. Uh, several times from a story perspective on that game because I tried maybe to go a little bit wider. I wanted to really have Kratos' impact be felt throughout all of the world, throughout all of that Grecian world. So uh, maybe a little bit too much of the overreaching aspect and not personalizing his story. Uh, that's what I think is an exciting aspect about Ghost of Sparta is that it really gets down to Kratos' uh, heart, more of a personal story, uh, rather than maybe the overreaching grand epic that I was trying to go for, you know. Um, I think that is really a really good point. Like when we started working I, on that, story, that I screwed up. That no, was a no, good no, point. Not, not that you're dropping. Thank balls, you for that. You know, <laughs> you, I drop balls. Yeah, keep those keep those balls up. Right. But uh, no, no. <laughs> okay. That you know when when, we're, when we first started talking about. <laughs> balls. I can't say anything worse than you've already said. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that, that when we first started talking story on Ghost of Sparta, I mean, 
it's this huge story with this huge arc that, you know, one of the decisions we made early on was to focus on a smaller aspect of it, right? It's like, we kind of know the big picture, but let's, let's hone in on a part of his, his you know, his backstory uh, that'll connect this game to the other ones, and let's really tell it in fairly great detail so that you can get, you know, you can get a lot out of it, and you, you kind of feel like, oh, wow, we, we didn't just kind of gloss over that. That was kind of an important thing, and it really does tell me a little bit about why he's so pissed off. And, you know, so I, I think that that was actually a cool, a cool choice. Maybe you dropped some balls, but I think you picked them up. Thank you. We're going back to that? David's yeah, we're, going back. we're done with that, though. Right. <laughs> we get the reason behind the rage. Hmm. So what did each of you learn from Kratos along his journey? I can tell you exactly. Um, I mean... God of, I mean, God of War is about a guy who, God of War 1, is about a guy who puts everything aside for his ambition for work. And he loses his wife, and he loses his kid. And, you know, that's all I need to say about that, so. I don't even want to follow up with anything now. <laughs> yeah, that's I don't funny. mean to be you sad. Could, I mean, you couldn't have waited till last. <laughs> it's, about, it's, about, it's about putting your work ahead of your spirit. I mean, that's... That's what I, I mean, I, I, you know, that's what it was about for me. So I guess killing people solves problems. It's not really going to go over <laughs> no, so well. Not go. No. <laughs> you're, like, you're the one who went grander and bigger. It totally can be. Right, yeah. No, I did learn something from Kratos, actually. Uh, tell me, that tell me. What you want, you should just take it. It seems really basic and really simple, but quite honestly, Kratos gets everything he wants save for the fact that he doesn't get those horrible memories of killing his family out of his head, uh, which was a great little whoop, pull the football away. Um, but I really do believe like there is a lot to be learned from that. Of You know what, if you want something, be damned the consequences. Be damned this sort of pessimistic thinking that you could talk yourself out of it and just do it. Because if you don't do it, you won't do it. <laughs> I, it's, well, it's now deep. it's time for deep it's, thoughts. It's very, it's very true, though. <laughs> no, very, it's very true. And Dana, we haven't seen your game yet, but uh. yeah, well, soon, soon enough. Yeah. But uh, no, I mean, I, I think from a character standpoint, I think super insightful what what Dave just said about the whole idea of Kratos basically forsaking the things that really matter in his life for his job. It's like war, making these games. These games are really, really hard, so who you have in the trenches with you really matters, and you know, it's a, a really strong group of individuals that work together as a team to make these games, but uh, we're all sacrificing stuff. We're all making choices every day you know, to make these games as epic as they are, so you guys will enjoy them, but there's a cost to all of them. So, so like, remember, when you get your five bucks off at GameStop for the used copy, <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> The God of War series saw Kratos traversing worlds not often seen in video games. Let's take a look at his epic journey. From the majesty of Athens to the depths of Hades, no ground was held sacred by Kratos. With every city you destroy, the wrath of Olympus grows. Beginning with a furious battle in the Aegean Sea, God of War takes the gamer on a journey across historical locales and mythological spaces, each with its own unique character and threats to the former Spartan captain. There is safe passage through the deadly sands, but only those who hear and follow the siren song will discover it. Level design is a lot about coming up with the puzzles and the layout and the pacing of an area and coming up with the themes and how they integrate with the story. Amidst the diversity of environments, they all have one thing in common. A grand scale with larger-than-life set pieces waiting for Kratos to conquer. So many levels in these games are these just massive, massive environments where Kratos is almost just this, this tiny little character running through it. Do you ever think there was any danger of, dis of diminishing your protagonist? Not no, at all. He builds no. that no. big thing. <laughs> right. It, was, mean, it gave you that sense of scale, you know, so that when you did zoom in and see the character very big on screen, you carried that visual memory with you and you were like, oh my god, this thing is huge. Like in the first one, just that little shot of Kratos sidling outside oh, and yeah, seeing Kronos see below, below. You know, these images carry with you as the gamer, so you're remembering those later when you're not seeing it, but the implication is there. So those, I think, were a, a really... But these guys Excellent took it to thing. the next. Yeah, I think the, the level, I think a yeah. big part of it is the camera, what you're doing with the camera, and base, 
you know, trying to zoom in as, as close to Kratos as possible. We would always try to make sure that we could get as close that we could see the edge of his blades on the screen. So that we, you could always see the enemies, you know, that, that, that way you know that um, you can engage with the person that you're fighting with. And then we would try to pull out as far as we could in the next shot and then push back in, all doing it in real time. What's, what's amazing about the stories and the games is the fact that, yeah, you might feel small or you might feel small, you know, visually to that, but the fact that you change the world. This game, you don't just live in this world. Kratos changes this world as the games go on. And being able to change something that's that big is one of the reasons why this game is so epic. And it also makes him feel so much bigger. It's not just about the scene and the scale of the scene, but it's the uh, distance of the, the journey. And he, I mean, he basically, in, in God of War 2, I think does the best job of that of any of the games. I mean, he goes on this journey to the edge of the earth. And this one guy did this. He got on, on Pegasus and he flew across the ocean. And, and uh, you know, he goes under the world and he fights Atlas. And, and uh, remembering that stuff when you're playing the game and kind of compiling all the stuff that you did in the last 10, 15 hours or whatever. It's like, holy shit, this guy, this guy is bigger than everything. Again, it's not really just about the size of what you're fighting. It's the repercussions that, that, that it has. When you finish that certain portion of a game or level or boss, it's what happens after that. You know, one of the cool things about God of War 2 is like, you know, just purely walking across those horses and, you know, like, when you have the feeling that you're just walking in the environment, it's one thing. But then when you drag everything, you know, out in the right. sea, suddenly you realize it's not about the size. It's the repercussions of what you're going to do to that. That's the important part about making games. And that's why I agree with Dave. It's like finding a different way of actually doing it. It's not just about size. Like, you know, it's not just about... Size does doesn't that, matter. Does that, yeah, well, <laughs> that <laughs> came out also <laughs> wrong. I, I agree. Matter, like, the, the, the concept of the size and the spectacle is really good, but you make a valid point about the whole connection to spectacle. Just having spectacle for spectacle's sake is kind of retarded. It's just so that you can have something on the back of the box. But the idea of connecting spectacle meaningfully into the gameplay, into the player's experience, so that it doesn't just feel like, I built a big level because I can build a big level. Aren't I awesome? These games actually allow me to get inside of them and be part of that experience. So. Was there any challenge in keeping the epicness of these environments, you know, consistent through the games, but putting them on the PSP? Absolutely. Oh my God. <laughs> it's like everything that's in your head, you know, you don't, the one thing that we did when we developed uh, both Go, uh, Chains of Olympus and Ghost of Sparta, we didn't think of them as uh, PSP games. As a matter of fact, I think at the very beginning, when you first talk PSP games, you know, the ideas were thrown around. It should be like a 2D side scroller. It should be Kratos, you know, swinging his blade, 2D side scroller, climbing, like, you know, not really a God of War game. And we had to push and we had to go, you know what? No, we need to replicate everything about God of War on this platform. It's all good when you say that to somebody and you go, like, we're going to do it. And then you got to deliver and everybody's looking at you, like, waiting to, for you to do that. And, and yes, in your head, in concept art, in, you know, just creating the worlds, it all works. As soon as you got to get it in there, it's like, you know, literally it's like shoving this big thing in this little hole and you're just going like, I can't do it, I can't do it. And every single time, I know. Sorry. I saw that. Wow. Well, because, because you should have a button like Dr. Evil and anybody who makes a fucking cock reference, yeah. boop. And so, you know what? We'd be the only ones left so far. That's all I'm saying. You're making up for it, Jaffe. What's that? I said you're making up for it. Yeah, I know, no, no, no. You so much class. class. All right, Olivia. All right. <laughs> oh, snap. I think there were a lot of things we didn't even consider early on that actually made a big difference was like God of War, and, uh, until the time we'd done Chains of Olympus, already existed on like a four by three aspect ratio on a regular TV. So there was a lot of vertical real estate we didn't have on the PSP. I mean, it's a 16 by nine display. And so having a character who has aerial combat, like he's constantly jumping off the screen, you know? So we kind of picked the camera distance that felt fairly safe so you could see him, you could see the action. And we're like, okay, let's kind of leave that alone and see if we can get everything to work. Um, and it does. Um, and then we followed the playbook essentially of, you know, these epic, you know, big grand scale shots. We put them in there. And um, I think with all those things, they kind of work together and, and it still feels like God of War. And then when we went to, to make Ghost of Sparta, we're like, okay, let's try, let's try like, to be even more cinematic about it. Let's keep the camera out and let's let him get kind of small. And, and playing off of these things that you were talking about in the character design, you know, like he's got this ashen skin, he pops on screen. He's got these chains that glow and he's whipping around. They're way bigger than he's ever gonna be. So if you show him really close up, even on the PSP, and he fills most of the screen and then you pull out because a giant monster just came out of the ocean and he gets really tiny, it's okay because so long as he's still readable and he, he lights, 
it's going to work and it's going to still feel epic. And I think even on the handheld, people are just going to be surprised that it still works. Still yeah, you just got to hope that your PSP doesn't blow up or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> All right, so Dana, let's talk a little bit about uh, Ghost of Sparta because we actually get to delve into the lost city of Atlantis in this, which is something we all know and yet we know nothing about it. So what kind right. of research went into developing this? I mean, we kind of looked uh, into some of the the ways that people had thought, you know, Atlantis had sunk. We were like, where could it possibly be? We looked at locations. Um, we actually looked at some of the, the work that had been done previously for God of War on Atlantis. Like, apparently Atlantis was a place that was slated to be in, what is it, one two, or two games? Two, two games two. now. No, in God of War 2. God of War oh, 2. just in God of War 2? Okay, in God of War 2 even. Um, and there was some fantastic concept art that was done for that game, and we're like, oh. You know, they had, they had already some ideas. Um, so we looked into all that, we kind of factored that in, and uh, then we started having a little bit of fun with it, as God of War tech, you know, seems to do with everything. We were like, well, you know, if there's a city of Atlantis, what better way for it to disappear than you know, having your, your main character be responsible for, for the end of it. Nice. The strength of a protagonist is defined largely by the antagonist standing in his way. And with God of War, there was no shortage of gods, mortals, or monsters attempting to stop Kratos on his path of vengeance. So here's a look at the villains of God of War. Ares, you will die for what you did that night. If vengeance is the central theme of God of War, then those at the receiving end of Kratos' revenge must tremble at the mere reputation of the mighty Spartan. Yet the villains standing in the path of Kratos definitely hold their ground against him, as they themselves are extraordinary forces to reckon with. From legends such as Hercules to gods like Ares, each posed a formidable threat to the Spartans' path of vengeance, all leading to the ultimate villain himself, the king of the gods, Zeus. They have so much history, and that history kind of unfolds in the, the horrible things that they do to each other. I will tolerate your insolence no more! With the vast number of possible enemies within Greek mythology, how did you narrow down your choices and differentiate your enemies from the previous titles? I'm going to let everybody in on a little secret. I have, I've seen this drawing that David did, and I don't know if he knows that anybody else has even seen this thing, of the <laughs> cast of God of oh, War yeah. monsters. It's, it's like a napkin awesome. drawing. It's, it's like it on the board. Like a, you, do you it has a that? Gorgon on it, Cyclops, and that's it. That's all the characters you need. It's this bestiary of animals drawn on a, on a napkin. <laughs> no, I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of good creatures out there. There's a lot of good characters in mythology. So it's that notion again, of what do people expect out of mythology? So we, we obviously picked those A characters that maybe people have already seen already in the previous games, but we, we kind of put a new spin on them. We try to redesign them, not just because we want to be clever, but because we feel like if they don't offer something new each time you play these games, then you're just going to get bored of them. So we went back and we, we actually looked at our entire cast of characters that we used for Chains of Olympus. And I think even though we may have only brought over like five characters from the last game, we redid them all. And then obviously we added all new characters to the cast as well, which we're not going to divulge all of them. But you know, everything is fresh. We try to look at it and go, how can we make this guy better? Uh, all right, Stig, I want you to answer this question last. So the other four of you. Why do you think Kratos kills himself? That's a good question. I mean, to me, it's like, at the end of three, when, uh, when Athena is, is demanding back her power, you know, it's obviously, like, he's, he's basically de deciding that he's done being manipulated. Like what, what Corey was saying, you know, it's like everybody's been just taking him on this ride and they're all lying to him and nobody's made his situation any better. And so I think he realizes at the end that if he can't save himself, then maybe he's just going to do, you know, do a solid for humanity. So he's going to deny her that ability and by effect allowing mankind to basically, you know, take it up for themselves. And so I think it's this cool kind of, I'll sacrifice myself for the greater good. Well, I don't know. I, I, one, one of the things that I think rings through, true in, uh, in the series and in all games is that at one point or the other, I think Kratos knows himself, even though, you know, Athena tells him and all that stuff, it almost seems like he knows that he'll never forgive himself. He won't. From the moment that something, the, the, that, that moment happens, you know, with the, killing his family, killing his daughter, it's something he can never get back. He seeks it, he wants redemption, he wants forgiveness. Actually, he wants to forget more than he wants, you know, forgiveness. And at one point or the other, I mean, we've explored this in our stories on a more personal level, 
he can't. He, it's just that he's doomed. He is all, you know, forever doomed. And I, I think like, you know, what you see actually in, the, in, in him killing himself is really the, the fact that he can't forgive himself. He won't, he'll never will. Korea, David, do you have anything to add? Mm. You go first. Well, I mean, there's, there's this, the smarmy answer. <clears throat> the smarmy answer is <clears throat> death and God of War is pretty cheap. He's already been dead a couple of times and crawled his way back out. So at this point, it's kind of like just taking a flight, you know, somewhere. I, you know, but, but, but from a story standpoint, I mean, you know, he, God of War, the entire God of War story opens with him trying to kill himself. He clearly doesn't really care about dying. And once he's done what he came to do, which was get his revenge, um, you know, maybe there's a sense of now I can finally go be with my wife and kid who are, who, are, who are dead. And so maybe it was to be with them. I mean, I think the ending of three, uh, you know, was intentionally ambiguous. I mean, correct? I mean, I, I kept, I, I, I can't say I entirely understood the intent behind it. I got on Facebook immediately. It was like Pappy, who is the, what, the lead designer on three. I'm like, what, it, what is this? You know, not in a bad way, but like explain to me what, what I'm, you know. So, I mean, it, it was a good ambiguousness, but... Um, for me, I kind of took it like he wanted to be with his wife and kid. He did what he came to do. And if uh, Athena ends up kind of not getting what she wants and mankind gets what they want or what they ultimately have in the process, great. But he's basically done. I think Kratos is, is kind of an accidentally altruistic character. I don't think that he has ever an intent. He never has intent to be altruistic. He never has intent to help mankind. So it was a little bit of a struggle for me to see that he's doing something to help Mankind making a conscious decision. It feels very awkward for him as a character. As far as why he killed himself, honestly, I, I, you just kind of said it. Like, I, death means nothing in this world. Uh, you crawl out of Hades, and there's a whole life that goes on after you die. So you kind of get caught in this little loop of like, okay, he killed himself, but then he's going to still have to live with the fact that he killed his wife and child just at another location, and he won't really be able to do anything except there's been a therapy out. down there. I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, honestly, I was a little confused by that, but I, I think maybe it is, like David said, it's a, an intentionally a, a ambiguous concept at the end. Um, I would say he did it for ratings. <laughs> Isn't that true of anything in Hollywood? Yeah. All right, so stay, give us our answer. Did he? He did it for ratings. He did it for ratings? Yeah. <laughs> Good job. Yes, um, I got it right. You know what? Everybody was pretty much right. Corey's right. It's, he, Kratos didn't do it for mankind. That was kind of a byproduct of what him getting what he really wanted. And uh, all he ever wanted was to die and be back with his family, hopefully. I mean, who knows where they are right now? But everything has changed, and, and maybe that's the only thing that he's got left. I mean, he's a pretty selfish guy, and I don't know if he really wants to be with his family for any like good reasons other than to kind of say that he right, righted the wrong that he did to himself. So, and to them. Right, exactly. But I mean, I don't, I don't even know if it really mattered to him what happened to them as much as what he did to himself by killing them. He's a very selfish guy. Well, and I think that's one of the reasons, and again, I, I give, I'll take 10% of the credit, but I'll give you 90% of the credit of, of the hug in God of War 1, which to me is one of the very few instances in video games, certainly mainstream video games, where I, I go, okay, you know what? You can mix emotion and gameplay together where you actually see and get to play a hint that, okay, here's some depth to this guy. He, 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 when he hugs his wife and kid and it's a play mechanic, I just thought that was the greatest thing in the world. To me, when you say he's selfish, he is, but I think moments like that, which are very few and far between, do show him as someone that underneath all of this, it's a guy who loves his kid, a guy who loves his wife, and I thought that was Ghost great. Ghost of Sparta has a lot of that. I haven't seen it. A yeah, lot of that. It. Yeah. It's badass. I swear. <laughs> Now, Ruse kind of touched on this already, but do you guys believe that Kratos has finally forgiven himself? No. No. I don't, I don't think he ever could. Uh, I think that that's the fire that burns inside of him, you know? I think that's what drives him forward. Um, and I honestly think if he went to Elysium and saw his family, I personally don't feel that he could face him. Well, I think it's cool too that like if he's such a vengeful character that it's even like an internal vengeance. Like he won't forgive anybody who's wronged him, including himself. So if he's going to kill himself, it, I, that doesn't seem like someone who's forgiven themselves. You would probably be like, okay, I forgive what I've done. I'm going to live with it, and I've I've come to terms with it. Stig, was there ever a moment where you wanted to answer that question while directing the game? Well, I think there's a whole gameplay sequence where we, where we do that right before we go into the first person kill with Zeus. I mean, he walks. You walk through his steps, and he finds his uh, wife and daughter. 
and then he finds Athena, and he, and he basically comes, he comes to terms to a certain extent with himself, but does it, does it mean that he forgives himself ultimately? Um, I think that's still in question. I mean, there's more things that we could do with it, and I, I, don't, I don't really want to like, get into that right now, because maybe potentially that's something we might see in the future. But that sounds like there's a sequel coming. <laughs> that sounds like God of War 4 might be coming soon. <laughs> there it is, announced. Key to his battle with Zeus is the Blade of Olympus, a massive sword that is somewhat of a reoccurring character itself. But that wasn't the only weapon Kratos had in his arsenal throughout this saga. When we were designing the main character, you know, it was how do you put a guy on a box cover that people are going to immediately know who he is. It was all about the weapon. When attempting to topple the gods of Mount Olympus, sometimes brute strength and sheer will are simply not enough. You have learned to use the Blades of Chaos well, but they alone will not carry you to the end of your task. As such, Kratos encounters a plethora of unique weapons to use. Some earn... These are the Blades of Exile. They will help guide you on your journey to the flame. While some... Taken. Either given by a god or taken from an enemy, each of Kratos' weapons leaves him more equipped on his journey of vengeance. Well, the game's designed around you having to beat the crap out of lots of guys. It's when it's you and one other guy. I mean, he's done for. Alright guys, what is the coolest weapon that Kratos has used? Wow, that's tough. The blades. The blades. <laughs> chaos, yeah. I mean, that's definitely probably the right answer, obviously. I actually, I like the bow. First, like, first in, when I started playing God of War 2 with the bow in it, I, that felt just right because now you've got this extension, this like, kind of projectile thing, and then we took it a little bit further in God of War 3, but I, I'd say for me, hands down, it's probably the bow just because you can whip it out at any time. You can light guys on fire, like groups of guys. And it's... it's there we go again. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Beep! <laughs> um, See, I didn't even but, know uh, that time. I think it, was, it, it, it allows a, a nice kind of um, wild card to be thrown into the battle. And um, yeah, it's sweet. You know, there was a moment, I think, uh, I had taken a trip over to Santa Monica, and you guys were not done with God of War 3 yet, but you were showing me like a little test level and you guys had like the Blade of Olympus all decked out there. And you know, I was like, oh my God, the Blade of Olympus is so badass. Like, obviously I, I think the blades first and foremost are the best weapon in the, in the game. Um, but that thing, you know, it, it's cool because I mean, it looks like it belongs to somebody important. I think that was, that was one of the things that I always thought was uh, really clever about God of War um, was that a weapon is a weapon, but at the same time, like it should also be a character too. I mean, when I look at the Blade of Olympus and it has like all those, those people on it and, it's got that crazy big blood groove and it glows uh, blue. I, I look at that thing and I go, that's, that's just like, it inspires me to want to chop people up with it. <laughs> okay. In a good way. He's a little sure. yeah. I mean, there's like two categories for that too. There's the, the sort of iconic aspect of Kratos' blades. They're like the fedora and the whip for Indy. I mean, they're very, like, Kratos is not Kratos without the blades. So the, I think the weapons are fantastic. As far as the gameplay usage, I actually really like Army of Hades and Kronos Rage. I think those ones were awesome. The fire and forget, you could just rock a bunch of enemies with that. Those were just absolutely fun to use. But they're kind of, you know, they blend in the background with the sort of large collection of magics and weapons that you use. So I think the blades sort of always win hands down. Well, I, I think the Medusa head was the very first image I ever had of God of War. The idea of a guy going around with this and sort of using it as a weapon. I still love that, and I love the move you guys did in 3, which was kind of like the Spartan flanks, kind of everybody kind of, you know, huddling up, and then I love that move. So. The shields? Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. So, Dana, what new weapons can we expect in Ghosts of Sparta? Uh, wow, it's a good segue into that, I guess. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I guess touching on kind of what you were asking just a second ago, um, one of the weapons that we kind of already put out there that people have been, you know, seeing and you, you played with, I guess, at E3 probably as well, is uh, the Arms of Sparta, which is a spear and shield combination. Um, and that actually comes from just, you know, classic, you know, visuals that we see Spartan warriors, you know, wielding. We took a different approach with the secondary weapon in Chains of Olympus because uh, we just wanted to do something different and, and actually really change up the play style. I think the same is true with, uh, with this weapon, the spear and shield combination we have in uh, Ghost of Sparta, because 
I think we realized it's not a good idea to try to outdo the blades. The blades are just awesome. Everybody loves them. They play great. You can do cool stuff with them. They're always going to be good. The thing to do is to maybe go, what, what else could Kratos use that's, that's also useful that doesn't compete with that, that maybe complements it or allows you to play in a different way? Um, so we started looking at defense, you know, and it's like this thing where it's like, it's not really fun maybe for the you know, average gamer to play defensively, right? Like, I don't want to be sitting there, hunk, you know, hunkering down, just blocking all day. I just, I want to be out there mashing buttons and killing guys and just wrecking fools. Um, so we took defense and turned it into kind of an offense. Like, so he's got this shield and you can do, you know, offensive things with it. You can move while you're blocking. You can gain ground on guys. You can, you can just bash the crap out of them. You can launch them in the air with it. Um, so we took things that we know we love that work on the blades and we said, how can we you know, use those mechanics and, uh, and infuse them into this weapon with new moves and, uh, and kind of take a different take on it. So I think people are going to find that while there's another layer of complexity to the Spear and Shield and Arms of Sparta, that they offer, like, the, the chance to kind of play a different way with Kratos that I think a lot of people will find there's a lot of depth to and a lot of reward in it. Well, it also feels very Kratosy to turn defense into offense. I mean, he's yeah. not a man who's going to stand there and block. He's a guy who's just going to yeah. He's not going to wait for th he's not going to wait for things to happen. He's going to make them happen, even if it is being kind of covered up. Right. So, among the many revolutionary elements introduced by the God of War series, perhaps the most compelling is the epic storyline that takes Kratos through the world of Greek mythology, all while establishing his own legend. Here's a quick look into the sprawling saga of God of War. Is it Athens you have come to save? No, I got you! With its unique use of flashbacks and non-linear storytelling, God of War took gamers on a journey filled not only with adventure, but with powerful emotion. My wife, my Oh. The game is really to make you feel like you're in an adventure. You know, it's an epic adventure. It it's to really make you forget that it's just a game. I was trying to make you a great warrior. You succeeded. Not to be outdone, God of War 2 expanded on the legend even further, taking us through the massive world of ancient Greece and integrating Kratos' own quest with the stories of famous mythological characters. Do you not know who I am? Have you not heard of Icarus? So it's a sort of an interesting tying together of all these different elements and really bringing together the actual mythology of all of these gods being completely insecure because of the kind of cyclical nature of overthrowing each other. And like many epics before it, deeper stories can be gathered from the main plotline, such as the tales for Chains of Olympus and Ghost of Sparta. The two PSP games shed light and expand on a period of Kratos' life not seen in the trilogy. You! Your son has returned! I bring the destruction of Olympus! And God of War 3 provides an epic conclusion to a legend that has woven itself to mythic proportions. My vengeance ends now. All of this wrapped up with an intricate theme of vengeance and Redemption. The power of forgiveness comes from the living. Okay, obviously when you talk about story, you always have to start at the beginning. So, David, the story in God of War was actually told mainly through flashback, which isn't very common for video games these days. So why was that the motivation behind it? Um, well, I mean, you, you know, I, I'm a big believer in opening. See, I, won't, I was going to say opening with a bang, but I am not going to get the fucking button. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm a big believer in that. I mean, like if you look at Indiana Jones, if you look at James Bond, you know, the idea of opening with a suicide... Uh, you know, was was really compelling, but then obviously the question becomes, well, who is this guy and why? And so we immediately need to travel back in time a little bit to learn that. So that was the initial reason that we said, okay, let's let's tell things out of order because we need to open. I don't want to open with a tutorial. I don't want to open with learning the character. And learn. You just want to get in and play, you know. Um, and so that was that reason. But the other reason was, you know. Uh, a lot of times when you play video games, you know, it may take you a day or a week or a month or longer to finish it, just depending on the length of the game and what's going on in your life. And, and so you tend to forget a lot of the details. And so it was important that the core through line was very simple. It was Raiders of the Lost Ark in Greek mythology, go get the box. The Ark was Pandora's box. And even if you had, you know, spent six months away from God of War because another game came out or you got busy with other things, 
that was a pretty simple thing to kind of hang your, your brain on. I know what this is about. <clears throat> so I didn't want to complicate that through line for that very reason. Um, you know, and then the question was that, that if, you, if that's all you do, you end up with a story that is flat. There's nowhere to go with it. And so the idea behind the flashbacks were that we could still travel that very simple core story, but for people who wanted more, we had these flashbacks that allowed players to learn more and get more of his story. And if you played it all within a weekend or something where you could kind of actually take the whole thing in, ideally it would have been a satisfying experience, and clearly for a lot of people it was. But that's the reason we chose the flashbacks. So, Stig, you had the honor of actually ending the story, ending the trilogy, uh, but if the rest of you had your way, how would it have ended? <laughs> <laughs> I've read some interesting stories on Wikipedia, so I'm actually really interested. Well, in I mean, answers. look, I'll, you know, Corey and I, I mean, I can't speak to where his head is today, but we had a story mapped out uh, that I, that I, desperately pleaded with Stig. I remember sitting on the floor of my house in San Diego, you know, pitching you. But we had that phone call. And, you know, and, and again, as I've said, and I'll say it again here, I, I think God of War 3 is, is, uh, is definitely one of the best games that's come out this year, and I thought it was just an absolute blast. So, you guys, I mean, there's, this is no... Obviously, you're always going to have your own way of what you would have done, and, and I abdicated that seat a long time ago, and so I have no issues at all. I thought they did a brilliant job, but we had had worked out a different story and a different ending that I still think would, would, have, would have been cool, and I've, I've, you know, I've talked about it in the press before, and, and you know, so it's, it's not like a secret or anything. Can you elaborate a little here? No, he's talked about it in the press before. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the, the high level was, and jump in on the stuff I've forgotten, but the high level was basically you kill Zeus in the first couple of minutes of God of War 3. Uh, there's a vacuum in Greek, there's a vacuum in, on Earth because the, the Greek mythology religion is in shambles. The other religions and gods rush in, Norse mythology, Egyptian mythology, to kind of take over that, that place now that Zeus is no longer a, a power. And it really becomes sort of a, a, a mashup of Greek and, and Egyptian and Rome, uh, 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 Norse mythology, where Kratos kind of gets to journey to all these other locations. And, you know, it kind of sounds like a toy, but you'd have, like, Egyptian Kratos and Norse Kratos, and he kills Thor and takes the hammer. And I always love the idea that uh, the reason we have the Sphinx in Egypt is he has used the Medusa head to freeze this creature out in the desert, which ultimately ends up being what the Sphinx is. But ultimately, he ends up getting all the gods to fight amongst themselves. Um, thus ignoring man on earth. And the way Kratos realizes that you kill gods f with finality is that you get people to stop believing in them. So as the gods have ignored man, man begins to turn away from the gods, and that's how Kratos kills all of the gods. And now with all of the gods dead, he uses the blades of chaos. We were going to use the six axis, and you were slitting your wrist. And he basically, that's how he dies. And the last scene would have, like, sawing a log. Uh, the last scene would have basically been... Uh, two things, there were two epilogues. One was the sort of the controllable wise men mm. uh, going towards the North Star, indicating that even with all that Kratos has done, uh, man always needs something to believe in, something to aspire to, and sort of, it was the beginning of, of, of the rise of the new gods that, that we have today, and a lot of people would say are also on their way out. Um, and then there was a second epilogue. There was a second epilogue where ultimately what happened to Kratos, and we had talked about, I know it's been attributed to different people, but the ultimate idea was that the Blades of Chaos were sort of ultimately melted down to become the Grim Reaper Scythe, and Kratos becomes the Grim Reaper. And sort of that was sort of the ultimate way, correct, that we had planned on ending the whole God of War. That was the way you planned on ending well, it. Well, we, come on, it was in God of War 2, no, too, had, No, we had done talks. What I was setting up in 2 was this idea that Athena had died and was the first person in the pantheon of gods to actually have a selfless act, to die from a selfless act. So she had kind of ascended to this higher level. And then at first she's somewhat altruistic and being like, hey, wow, okay, I did pretty good. But then she starts to realize, wait a minute, I can actually affect the rest of the world. I don't want anybody else to get up here. I want to, and this is where I was kind of moving towards the monotheism Passover, was the idea of the one true God. She wanted to become the one true God. So she uses Kratos as like this earthly vessel to enact her plan 
Um, whether she admitted it in the third game or if it would continue on past that, uh, it always kind of, for me, felt like everyone's betraying him and she's the one coming with this cloak of friendship and even throughout the entire game, she always maintains that, that friendship, that idea that, look, I sacrificed for you, I, I prevented you from killing Zeus, but I did it for a, a, a bitter, bigger reason. You know, there was a, a greater cause to ensure that Olympus stayed strong, otherwise you wouldn't want what was going to come after that. And then she realizes what could come after that would be her in control, her in power. So instead of like dogma where Alanis Morissette is God, it would be like, you know, Athena would be God. But what was great about that, though, was the weapons. It was like Kratos had the Ten Commandments, and he was like, thou shalt not right. kill. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Bro. Were Dana any ideas? Or even Stig, did you have any other endings that you were toying with? Well, there's another longer ending than what we did. I mean, there's, a, there's another place that, that we could take it and that I really wanted to do. It's something that, I, unfortunately, I thought of it um, too late. Like, I re it really came to me too late. And uh, it, was, it was one of those deals that there's no way we could have done it, gotten it done on time. But it kind of sets the groundwork where I kind of see the, the, the game going, in the, potentially, in the future. Out of War 4, people. Out of War 4. <laughs> While these five visionaries have differing views on the ultimate fate of Kratos, they can certainly agree on one thing. The God of War franchise has left an indelible mark not only on gaming history, but also among a whole culture of fans. Let's take a look at the lasting impact of this legendary franchise. My lord, Kratos! Another city is ready to fall! Soon all shall know the glory of Sparta! While God of War may have simply intended to become an action-adventure game, it has clearly struck the imaginations and psyches of millions of fans. It was excellent. It was, you know, disgusting and, and exciting all at the same time. Spawning a brand legacy that rivals the biggest names in pop culture. I said I think this game needs to be a defining game for this generation, and I truly believe it will be. It is no longer just a series of games. It is a phenomenon. Uh, this is one of the best things I've ever seen. This pretty much blew everything completely out of the water. Setting the bar for games to come, it has spawned various merchandise tie-ins, demands for a feature film version, a best-selling CD, and a rapid fan base. So as Kratos was seeking vengeance at the summit of Mount Olympus, the God of War franchise found glory at the top of gaming history. So did you guys ever think the franchise was going to be as big as it is today? I mean, there were God of War Slurpees in that. That's pretty awesome. I'll tell you what, when I was playing, one of the things that when we were making God of War 1, I was always going home and playing other games. And nothing was as good as what we were making at work. I mean, not even close. We got Game of the Show at E3 that year. Like, we're going to get Game of the Year. And this, is, this thing is going to, like, go, people are going to go bananas over this game. So... From that point forward, I, you know, I think we kind of could see that the, the, the game was going to get huge. Um, Slurpee cups, I don't, I don't think that's something that, <laughs> that we could ever... That means you made it, dude. Pretty, exactly. <laughs> I think that, like, that what it means that there's God of War Slurpee cups is pretty awesome, the idea that the, the franchise has grown that big, but I kind of look at it as a mark of the apocalypse. That there's like Kratos Slurpee cups, I, I think that's weird. You know, know. You know like, the, the way I look at it, though, is like, when I was a kid and I saw the Superman glasses and I saw the, the Star Wars glasses, I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. And I still have some but of those glasses. But they were glasses. glass glasses, weren't they? Yeah, they were. they were. <laughs> they were. But it, it, it was really special for me to be able to work on something that I could walk into 7-Eleven and buy a Slurpee and, you know, just feel like a kid again. And it's like, this is, this is my game, you know? Let me just tell you, because everybody says, oh, well, don't you, you know, don't you wish you would have worked on God of War 2 and 3? And I don't. I just, my answer has never changed. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that I moved on and I'm thrilled with what the team did with the game. But that was the only time I was ever jealous, is when marketing sent me the picture that you guys put up there of the Slurpees. Because to, to sort of know that something I had had a hand in had sort of, you know, was in a position to sort of, you know, get into sort of the popular consciousness and popular culture by things like Slurpee Cups. I mean, I, the day after those came out, my kids had a carnival at their school, 
and like a spring fling or something. And I mean, granted, they're little kids and they probably shouldn't have been buying Slurpee cups with Kratos on it, but I saw kids <laughs> walking around, fifth, sixth graders, just like I was walking around with my Burger King glass of Boba Fett back when Empire was out and going, and going oh my God, this will be a memory for them. It's, to me, it's not the sign of the devil. I, I get what you're saying, but it really is, that's freaking cool. To the point that I called my Twisted Metal marketing guy and I said, look, you better Slurpee get Christ. me some Twisted Metal Slurpee Cups. <laughs> so, get me know, all that Slurpee Cup now. I don't know if we'll get it, but I want me some Slurpee Cups. So. I think you always kind of have a feeling, especially with, with you know, God of War already being established, that there's a huge fan base. And uh, I mean, Rue and I used to work at Blizzard, so we're, we're kind of familiar with what crazy fandom is. Yeah. Um, but yeah. to me, that, like, that's not as like, kind, of, kind of crazy as the little small personal interactions that, I, that I've had working on this game were like, I almost got killed in a Taco Bell, I swear. Uh, the, I, was, <laughs> I mean, yes, yeah. I, I was wearing you know, one of the God of War shirts, the black ones with Kratos on it, where he's got the arms back like this. And this guy with Coke bottle glasses, and I kid you not, a disc man with an Aerosmith sticker on it. Sweet. I mean, a disc man. This is like this awesome. year. A disc man. <laughs> he looks me up and down, and he walks over to me really creepily, and I'm like, is he gonna shank me? Like, what's going on? <laughs> and he points to me, and I'm like, just like this. I'm like, what is it? You know, and he goes, this shirt. Where did you get this shirt? And I was like, Whoa, okay, oh my god. And then, he seems like a bad guy in a kung fu. <laughs> no, 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 seriously, he had like this, he had like this die-hard accent, it was awesome. <laughs> but I mean, like, you know, so I, I kind of said, you know, uh, you know, we work in games. I didn't even say that we were working on God of War, but he proceeds to tell me his impressions of God of War 3, and, and the action in God of War 3, and the ending of God of War 3, and he starts to tell me, like, literally like a game review about God of War 3, and I didn't solicit any of it, you know, I was scared for my life. Um, <laughs> but he held me captive for about 10 minutes, you know, in Taco Bell, telling me about God of War, and he was just a fan, you know, so like, he loves the game, and there's so many people out there who are like that, so these little, these little stories that, I, you know, we have to tell about yeah. this stuff, they're so meaningful, and, and they, they stay with you, it, it really does give you a sense of like, what you're doing touches people, you know, even if it's only for, you know, a few hours, it's, it means something to them, and they really enjoy it, and they want more of it, and they, they appreciate what you're doing. So, you know, it's a big thing, and I, I think all of us are very lucky to, to be a part of it as well. So, beyond me starting rumors for God of War 4, there's also rumors of a God of War movie, uh, and if that was to ever happen, who would you guys like to see to play Kratos? Shia LaBeouf. Oh, <laughs> oh man! He's in every movie now. He's That's so yeah. good. He's so good. I think some names have been thrown out actually before from Vin Diesel to her, but but for me at least, uh, just character-wise and somebody that comes closer to who Kratos is is Jaiman Hansu. He's get, like get, Dave was saying just a little early, earlier. He's getting old, a little bit old, but at the same time, he's got that demeanor. He's got that physique. He's got that the right just face there. The, the complexity and also the intensity, actually, when you look at his face, so definitely him. I think we need to take T.C. Carson and get him on a serious roids like, <laughs> program. Because he could, definitely, he could definitely act the part. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, be, I, I haven't seen anybody, anybody yet. I mean, I ask the question all the time, and there's nobody that's like, yes, that's the guy right there. Well, I'll tell you two things. One is, um, part of the problem is Kratos is intentionally not beautiful. You know, when we were, I remember sitting back there with, uh, it was Charlie and it may have been Ken Feldman who's been the art director on all these. Um, and we were doing his face on God of War 1 and it's like, you know, every video game character is like a pretty boy. Let's, let's break his nose a little bit and let's, you know, let, let's kind of make him look like a, a real guy and also not a guy who's 20. You know, so, he, you know, so to, to kind of find an actor who fits it, now they exist, but you know, they're not usually who the first people say when they think of it. But I will tell you, and I, 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 I don't, there was a, an agent uh, who I spoke with a few weeks ago, and she called me and she says, oh, I'm, they just told me who signed on to play Kratos. And first off, I was kind of like going, I didn't think we're still making a movie. I haven't heard anything about it for a long time. But so she, you know, she's connected and she says, oh, it's, and I won't tell you who it is, but she said, oh, it's this guy. And I said, oh, okay, that's, that's all right. I mean, it's not, it's not, you don't hear it and go, that's perfect. But you're like, that's pretty freaking good, you know. I will tell you the script went out about a year and a half ago to Daniel Craig, uh, who plays Bond, and I thought that was pretty darn good, but he turned it down. Um, but uh, this new person's pretty good if that actually ends up being true. So, uh, the How hint, could you I not will, tell us? I'll give you a hint. <laughs> Let me give you a hint. Um, 
a sequel to a movie that he starred in but hasn't appeared in any of the sequels just came out and bombed a few weeks ago. That's all I'll tell you. Just came out where? A few weeks ago. He starred in the original, hasn't been in any of the sequels. The, the last sequel just came out and crashed and burned. So that's your hint. I can't tell you who it is, but that's, you know. But you'll probably figure it out from that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, look at the movies that bombed Someone Google yeah. this right now and let me know. Yeah. It's a little unconventional, but what about Ben Affleck? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so do you guys have any advice for an aspiring game director? Pursue a job other than game directing and <laughs> yeah. luck, luck yourself into it. That's how we all got into it. Um, get, get good at communicating verbally and uh, through the written word with people. Um, you, conveying your ideas is a very large part of this job. If you're unable to actually communicate with people and get across what you need, not just what you don't like, but what you actually want and how to get people into that direction, then you're not gonna do very good at this job. And then uh, train yourself to not sleep. Yeah. <laughs> Ever. And you know what, and the other thing is believing, you have to believe in what you're gonna do and the idea that you have and the game you're gonna make, but more importantly, believe in the people that are around you. The game industry is way more, um, I don't know how to say, it's way more collaborative in some ways than a lot of other industries. Games are made by teams, you know. Games are not made by individuals. We can be a director, but we're only one piece of a big puzzle. And it's not like, you know, we're up here, but there should be like 100 people up here, you know, doing this thing. The point is that at every step of the way during your career, always have somebody around you who will question you. It's so important because the day somebody stops questioning you or you stop asking for that questioning. You become George Lucas. <laughs> I think one of the things, um, I, I think Corey said this, is that, I mean, don't aspire just to be, I mean, or don't try to be just a game director. Aspire to be a game director and, and become really good at something. Become really good at anything. If you're making a statue, try to, when you're making that statue, be the director of that statue when you're making it. You know, try to understand the story of what happened, who built that statue, and the story of what's going to happen to the statue after it goes in the game. And just try to be the best at any of those things that you can possibly be. I think what you brought up was kind of a good point too, Stig, which was that like, it's, it's good to be something to aspire to, but it's not going to just like happen just because you want it. Like being, being good at what you do and then kind of expanding on that and, and being able to, to prove to people that you know what you're doing, you're good at what you do is part of it too because then they trust you. I mean, part of making games at this, I think at this level is like, literally instilling trust in people that you're going to do the right thing for them, for yourself, for the project, you know, all around. And I think instilling that relationship with them where you guys trust each other to do the right thing, I think that's a huge, huge part about being a successful game director. I, I, if I may, I'm sorry. I just, I, I just, I, I don't mean to be contrarian, but. <clears throat> um, but you will be. Well, because, <laughs> a, 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 well, does anybody in here want to make games or that's just not interesting? Okay, so when I was at USC, I wanted to make movies and Jeffrey Katzenberg, who's a big famous movie maker, was there and they asked him the same question. They said, what would you say to aspiring filmmakers? And he said, anybody who actually is capable of getting into the position that they really know in their soul they want to be in, it doesn't matter what I say. And it doesn't matter what these guys say or I say, because you know, sitting in this audience, if one of you in here is actually the next one of us, or Genova, or Miyamoto, you know it doesn't matter what we tell you, because you're going to get there anyway, because that is what drives you and gets you out of bed. So when someone says, don't aspire to be a game director, I say, fuck that. I aspire to be a game director. I want to be a game director. And it's a great career, so aspire to it, because it's a lot of fucking fun. End of the day, regardless of what we're saying, if you want it, take it. Yep. And Thank if you're you. good at it, if you love it, people will follow you. Yep. There you go. I was actually kind of impressed by how many people raised their hands saying they want to make games, and I think a lot of these people are going to take your words to heart, but I also think a lot of these people probably want to ask you questions, too, so we're going to open up the floor. To you guys now. Where's our mic? Oh, there we are. Hey guys, thanks for coming out here. Uh, it's kind of a two-part question. Was it intimidating making this game First God of War, going up against titles like Devil May Cry, Legend of Zelda, and Ninja Gaiden? And the second part of that question, how satisfying was it to know that you've actually raised the bar, so now Ninja Gaiden and Devil May Cry are now looking towards God of War? Hmm. 
I mean, it, it was it, we were very aware of those games. Richard Fogey, who was up here, is is, is was a, one of our original combat designers. He's a great combat designer. And I remember we were playing Onimusha two or three, and we were like, "Holy shit!" We were we were oh, heartbroken. Three, three yeah, and, it's and, the John and, Reno one. And yeah. I remember he said he said to me, "I said, well, you know, I, I wanted to know." And I said, "Well, how, how do we compare to this?" He says, "Well, they're like a Harley, and we're like a Schwinn." You know, because this is before we really got our stuff together. Yeah. So we were very aware of those games, and we were. I was always worried, and, and and I to this day, every game I see scares the crap out of me. And it's. I think it's healthy, but yeah. it scares the crap out of me. They were the those games, and every game today is the demon that chases you. Yes. That tells you that you're not doing good enough, and the moment that you sort of outrun that demon completely is probably when you start making crappy Uwe Boll movies. <laughs> so. Uh, I think it, it's always there, and it's great to have because it keeps you on your toes. This is a very I mean, look, here's a good, you're doing Mad Max now. You can't not be looking at Red Dead and going, holy shit. Everybody. But, I mean, especially in sort of that Red kind of, Dead and Borderlands yep. and that twisted something. I look, no, every day I look at... <laughs> what is it? I, I, look at, I look at all the games. And you know what, also? I'm looking at Nate right there because Nate is a designer at Sony. And, Nate uh, Gary, ladies and yes, gentlemen. Nate, Nate, Nate Gary. Gary. Nate Gary, everybody. Um, he worked on God of War 2. He worked on God of War yes. But, you know, I, I, listen, every fucking day I'll talk to either, you know, Adam Orth at LucasArts or I'll, I'll talk to Nate sometimes. And I know where that oh, bar is. Let me is, pick that up for you. And I'll look at Twisted Metal and I'll say, shit, God, you know, amazing. I'm terrified every day. I don't know if on God of War 3, because you guys came out of the gate being the top of the cream of the crop, were you guys scared of anybody? Scared shit. Of who? Of what? Uncharted 2. Yeah. That was a pretty, <laughs> that was a pretty big game. Yeah. Um, Man, when we had to go up there and close E3 that year, they were opening E3 and we were closing. I, I was shitting my pants. And, then, and, and you know, even just seeing the stuff, Lost Planet 2 was blowing me away yeah. when I seeing the stuff in that. And then I finally played the game. I'm like, what happened? But I was so scared of that game for so long. But that's, that's really what it is. I mean, you're, you're scared. I, when yes. DMC came out, we called it Game Developers May Cry. Because I, I remember I, I was an artist at the time. and I'd never seen art like that before. I had no fucking clue how they were doing it. And um, that was one of the most satisfying things is when we finished God of War 1 um, and seeing some of the reviews, it's like, yeah, we, we actually, we beat them. And uh, it, was, it was a great moment. Cool, thank you guys. It's a good question. Very good question. Do you have another question? I have read somewhere, and correct me if I'm wrong, but God of War 2 originally was a PS3 game? Uh, I won't really correct you. Is that, yes, you're right. It was going to be either a PS3 or a PS2 game. Uh, so it could have been, could have gone either way. I was just wondering, how did that affect development? It was actually more fun. Uh, <laughs> uh, a lot of the onus behind the decision to stay on PS2 is that we already knew all the tricks. We knew how to figure out how to do what we needed to do. So elevating above what we had already done in the first one was a little bit easier without having to start all over on a new platform with all these new tricks. Um, but I don't... I'd like to believe that I was part of that decision, but I think the reality is I had nothing to do with it. I shouted a little bit, and then other people made the decision that are far well, can, above can, my pay grade. Just briefly, because I know the team wanted PS3, and I wanted PS3. And we were all like, oh my god, this is going to be so awesome, God, I want PS3. And um, one of the guys, none of our bosses, and when I was at Sony, I say <laughs> our bosses, but I still work with these people, don't get a lot of credit, but there's Alan Becker, and then above him, well, now there's Scott Rohde, but Shuhei Yoshida, who some of you guys know is the, is the head of all of first party he was the guy who had the foresight to say yeah you know we know it would be awesome on ps3 but just trust me put it on ps2 and after he said trust me like he was trying to convince us he said you're just gonna do it you know but ultimately <laughs> he was absolutely right because it made a crap ton of money on ps2 because there was such a huge installed base and it was the smartest yeah. decision even though creatively all of us including Shu, probably would have loved to have seen it on ps3 sooner so mm -hmm. We have time for one more question over here. Hey guys, thanks a lot for coming out here. So I was wondering, when you hear an idea that you really, really like, what gives you the sense that it could lead to a game that could hit the mass market, could really connect with a lot of people and ultimately be successful? Or maybe what gives you the sense that it should maybe remain outside of the game? I think the idea is simple. And that's what I thought was brilliant about God of War. And when I came and interviewed for the game, it was such a simple concept. Um, Greek mythology. Uh, on steroids, and uh, that's it. That's right. and, and you've got a badass that you're playing as, and, and I totally got the game. And, and 
I, I think that the other powerful thing about that is as a director, it, be, it becomes easier to sell the concept to everybody who's working on it as well. And it becomes, and it, potentially it's, it's, it's a launching board for um, everybody to kind of bring in new ideas because it's something that everybody can kind of live and breathe and understand. I don't know if there's any sort of like recipe or checklist to answer that. Like I, for me, it's more just like a, I, it's gut feeling. taking a, a gut feeling, you know, as Dave says, uh, that you kind of go, all right, well, I really feel this. And honestly, your gut is wrong sometimes. That's the thing. You could be like, man, that's going to be so badass. Rygar, man, it'll be awesome. <laughs> but then it doesn't turn out to be awesome, and you feel kind of silly. Or uh, calling all cars. Right, calling all cars. So, yeah, it, it, the tough thing is, uh, I think in, in, in this industry as well as all other industries, it's more like you have to pave your own way. You have to define who you are and, and, and how you express yourself inside of that. So trusting yourself rather than looking outside to try and validate whether or not what you have is right and then kind of forging forward. That doesn't mean that you don't course correct based on information with, of people around you. But if you have a fire about something, if you're excited about it, if you believe in it, then follow it 100%. And Be like Kratos. Go get it. Yeah. But I think, I think something about that, though, like, you're right, you could be wrong, but I mean, if your gut tells you that and you check that with a few other people, I mean, chances are, you know, if you're jazzed about something, I think other people are going to be excited about it too because you're probably not alone, especially if you, if you and a few other people feel like you're really onto something that other people can relate to and get excited about. I think you'll find that a lot of people do too. But you have to be excited and you have to protect it because there will be a million things between the day you have the idea and the day, the day it's sitting on the shelf that will try to sabotage it and, and change it. In every fucking game, you'll have at least two or three people on the team who think you're wrong and they're gonna come up and they're gonna fix it. And they're gonna change your idea and you gotta fight that and you gotta fight marketing. And it's, I don't mean, it's like these people are on your team, you wanna get behind them, but every day there's something and though you've gotta believe in it because it's gonna, it's, it's gonna get popular one day and unpopular the next and you've gotta be its champion. So. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Thanks. I'm sorry to say that is the end of our show. All right, that's our show. I'd like to thank the directors for participating in this momentous occasion, the El Porter Theater for this wonderful venue, and most importantly, you guys, the fans of God of War, for making a night like this even possible. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen,